Hello, everyone, and welcome to the series of talks that starts today, Making and Unmaking Exhibitions, Sustainability in Times of Planetary Crisis. This um, series will develop over the course of April, and we're really thrilled to start off today with this roundtable. My name is Claire Hoffman. I'm curator uh, here at Centre Culturel Suisse in Paris, and together with Nina Paim, designer and founder of um, the design research platform futurist.org, we conceived this program together. So over the past year or so, Nina and I have been discussing a lot, and so the project grew, um, especially while we observed a growing urgency to reflect on a more sustainable cultural sector. And um, so we realized that looking at sustainability not only regards ecological questions, but also needs to incorporate the perspective of social equity on a much more broader sense. So the title Making and Unmaking reacts to the current reality of uncertainty of planning in which we are all caught up at the moment, but also intends to critically look concretely at the functioning and misfunctioning of the cultural sector and exhibition making in particular. Therefore, we invited curators and um, museum directors, artists, designers, and community organizers to tackle the topics from their varied respective perspectives. Um, so before handing over to Nina and to our panelists today, just some quick um, technical information to you, uh, your our audience. So after a first round of presentation and discussion that will be led by Nina, um, there will be obviously also a moment for um, discussion. So we really intend this to be a platform for um, interactive exchange. So please do not hesitate to use um, the chat of the Twitch, which you will find by clicking on the little arrow on the upper right side of this um, screen. There you can write all your questions and comments. Um, the only thing you need to do is to create a Twitch login, which will take you approximately two minutes and which can be anonymous if you wish. So for today, we will start with a round table, which looks quite concretely into an example of sustainable exhibition architecture that was developed by a whole team for the DACA Art Summit. Um, and I'm really thrilled that we have um, this team today and I will hand over to Nina, Pime, designer and co-founder of Futurist. Um, and um, one more detail I forgot to say, but I'm sure um, Nina will also point it out, is that this whole series um, of conversations will afterwards be published on futurist.org as essays. So you can also read it up later. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, thank you so much, Claire, and good morning. Good afternoon and good evening everyone 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 watching us today uh, my name is nina i'm a design researcher a curator and an educator and i'm currently running futures which is a feminist platform for design politics and as claire mentioned this is a project that has been uh in process for a long time being made and unmade as we kind of hoped with the last year and uh we are really excited to finally be able to make it public starting today and unfolding over the month of April with a series of lectures tackling these very urgent issues. I would like to share my screen uh, for now. Yeah, I hope I, um, I hope you see my screen. Um, is it working, Claire? I hope. Can anybody give me a sign? Yes, it is working. Okay, good. Um, so, the questions that we're they're kind of stemming and, 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 and propelling us this month are how is the practice of exhibiting, be that of art, design, science, history, uh, fundamentally implicated in the imminent threats of climate change? And at the same time, how can exhibition making help us attain political momentum and agency around ecology? How can it support communities finding on the front line of climate change who are leading the way in safeguarding our collective future? Several of these reflections actually stem from uh, City Jan Abatan, a workshop for imagining, developing, and testing more sustainable exhibition and display strategies, which took place at the heart of the DACA Art Summit of 2020. 
Srijan Abatan in Bangla means creation and revolution slash rotation. It means creating something new using existing structures with small changes. Um, sorry. Today, uh, we have four people who participated in this project, who led it and who lived it. Diana Kento Betancourt, the artistic director of the Sandami Art Foundation and the chief curator of the Dhaka Art Summit. Intez Ashariar, a freelance architect based in Dhaka. Prem Krishnamurti, designer, curator, exhibition maker based between Berlin and New York. And Dries Rode, an architect at Truvan Rode, based in Basel, where I'm also living. But by no means, they are the only ones involved in this project. Sid and Abatan gather a bro much broader group of people, including, for example, Dr. Hureda Japin, an architect and scholar of gender and climate change working at the Brock University in Bangladesh, Mohamed Sazad, the production manager at the Dakar Summit, Mobinul Hake, engineer at the Dakar Summit, and many others, including myself. So today's roundtable is in many ways the kind of a mini reunion, a getting together to remember and also to critically reflect on what we achieved together, but also on how the project has changed us. But before we start this conversation, I would like to just give you a little bit of context on what we did. So um, here, uh, the Dakar Art Summit, as you know, is an important platform for the arts in Southeast Asia, organized by the Sandami Art Foundation since 2012. Ecology and sustainability have been core concerns for the summit, which happens biannually, always in the same building in the center of Dhaka, the Shupakala Academy, which you see here. Its 2020 edition, titled Seismic Movements, was centered around a broad question, like what is a movement and how do we ignite it one beyond the confines of an art exhibition? Oops, sorry. Due to its geography and geopolitical context, Bangladesh has often been referred to as the ground zero for global warming. There, climate change is not an abstract concept as sometimes it appears to be here in Switzerland where I live, but a tangible daily reality. One is also extremely present in Brazil where I come from. Dr. Hureira Jabin assessed the environmental impact of the Dakar summit of 2018 utilizing the equity share approach. Based on the materials, venue design, communication, waste, and energy usage, she estimated that that addition generated 18,000 tons of CO2. This is equivalent, this is the equivalent, for example, to a 747 flying uh, for 24 days nonstop. With Hereda's assessment, we were able to define a baseline to make decisions on how we could decrease emissions. But this was just the starting point for a process of co-design, which happened in Basel. Here you see us starting off the day with a breakfast. In order to help us find common ground, the architect Risorde built a scale model of the Shupakala Academy, one that was stackable so that we could break it apart and analyze the various spaces in the building. The model allow us to work directly with our hands, and in doing so, we were, able, we were able to switch positions and perspectives. In that sense, architects became curators, curators became designers, designers became engineers, engineers, artists, and so on. The model became a meeting point for us to engage in a conversation across our disciplinary and cultural differences. Over the course of five days, we brainstormed ideas, made sketches, and also analyzed the building through that model, looking for its spatial possibilities, as we call them, on how we could do more with less. Slowly, we started to agree on certain decisions, which were then tested directly into the model and then refined. And later translated into a very simple schematic code design. At the end of the week, we compiled all sketches, ideas and reflections into one thick bundle of principles and directions. These guidelines were neither a roadmap or a toolkit but a set of orientations to allow for the Dakar Summit team to finalize the process, but also to give them a set of arguments to engage in discussions with artists and curators and producers concerning, for example, the choice of materials, production techniques, and et cetera. So just to quickly talk, tell them, approach the environmental impact holistically, work with the building instead of against it, minimize, recycle, reuse, opt for sustainable curatorial strategies, address actual impact rather than aesthetics of ecology, improve the building as a lasting collective resource. 
Those schematic ideas were then developed and implemented by the team in Bangladesh. Here you see the detailed designs for a display developed by the architect Inteza Sharia. And later, prototype by the Dakar Summit team. Here you see a first fabrication attempt. The system uses regular standard scaffolding beams found everywhere in Dhaka, added a bamboo structure and then a layer of jute fabric onto which the artworks would later be locally made. Here you see the beginning of the installation site. And meanwhile, sometimes Dries, Prem, Catherine, myself and others outside Bangladesh would jump in as pairing partners providing fresh ideas or thoughts, opinions, or maybe just questions along the way. Here are some snapshots of our WhatsApp group, which was our main medium of communication this entire time. Here you see that same structure becoming a support for Geographies of Imagination, a long-term research project by Savvy Contemporary Berlin. And this particular iteration in Bangladesh was developed in collaboration with Jota Shilpa, a center for traditional and contemporary arts working as a melting pot where fine, fine art, folk art, native art, crafts are all juxtaposed and create together a new language. And here you finally see the, the, the final rendition uh, of the Geographies of Imagination. It's really an amazing project, it's super profound. I won't be able to explain in depth what it is, but I also really like to show you this other image of the back of that same support structure, which was then used as a backside um, for a puppet theater um, used by some of the youngest visitors of the Dark Art Summit. And this is a work uh, of Gidri Brali, a nonprofit and multidisciplinary organization in the arts uh, from Bangladesh. But of course, you know, this is just one example of one of the many st st strategies or structures that were devised through this process. Uh, the 2020 edition uh, spanned the four floors of the Shipakala build building, but it also exploded into its garden. So it's really a universe on its own. There's so much more to this exhibition than it's small than this small example that I that I just show. But it's really impossible to convey more in this short intro. I mean, I would like to conclude with this image here, which shows the windows of the Shipakala Academy wide open. This is just to point out that a lot of what was done in, done in terms of the exhibition design was actually not doing, not building, not making, in many ways refusing to design and refusing to engage in a certain kind of tradition of what exhibitions are, a tradition which is of course very much located into a Western capitalist and modernist mindset. For me personally, the project was a huge learning ground. I was able to attend its opening in February 2020, but shortly after, as you know, the pandemic hit. This was the last time I personally traveled, the last time I hugged strangers, the last time I danced in a party with other people. It really makes me sentimental because in a way, Claire and I have, would have wanted to organize this reunion in person and we kept believing that it would eventually happen. Um, but anyways, I'm very happy to have you all here today. Um, for me, the project personally, instead of providing answers, my personal engage in, engagement with this project opened more questions. It actually opened a field of possibilities of what design and exhibitions could be, what they could do in the world. As my good friend Prem Krishnamurti always says and is here, every exhibition is a rehearsal for another exhibition. Every workshop is a rehearsal for the next workshop. I am very curious to hear about how everyone here today looks at this project now with the vantage point of this one very difficult year past and what a year. And with that, I would like to jump into the discussion. So I would like to bring you all, please um, appear. Um, Diana, Prem, Dries and Inteza, you're very welcome to. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I would like to start um, asking Diana, who I think is like this one of the central pieces in this project of also really like putting it together. Um, from your perspective, Diana, what was um, Sirijan Abatan's most significant accomplishment? I mean, when you look back now, can you say it? Sure, I think, um, but it's a, but it's an ongoing accomplishment. You said something that really hit with me about not doing something, not designing. What is not seen there is how difficult it is to not do that. So, you know, in order to leave those windows open, it was six months of fighting to explain that, you know, what, what ACs did and to try to explain um, that these 
ACs, you know, were or the negative impact or what the possibilities were by not doing something. I think we proved that. So it's a blueprint that it can be done. But the kind of energy when we think about human energy to get that done was massive. And this is not something that can really be seen. Um, so I think what's not seen is we were pushing against an extremely rigid structure um, because it's also a government building. Um, and these things have have repercussions uh, later. But I'm, I'm extremely pleased that we were able to do this also to prove um, we had so something that hasn't come out yet. Um, you, you mentioned it was the last thing before COVID stopped the world, but we had nearly 500,000 visitors in nine days. The last Friday, we had 111,000 visitors in one day. I've never seen crowds like this before. And I looked around the summit and said, actually, we can never do something like this again, meaning that the, the volume of people and the volume of space and the artworks that that didn't work. But what you did do with this design was open up a circulation that would have not been possible. Like circulation was a huge, um, part of this design process, circulation of people through in and out of the entrances. So when you're building false walls, you're, you're cutting that circulation or circulation of air in and out of the building, viewpoints in and out, um, this kind of inside outside conceptually in the sense of how an exhibition impacts the world outside, also with our ecological footprint, but, um, but also in how to use the building as it is. Um, I think that was a, a really great lesson and something that we proved had we gone the old way the popularity of the show to the world outside would have collapsed the platform. Thank you so much. Um, I kind of want to bounce this to Intesa. Yeah. What do you think was the, the biggest accomplishment from your perspective? I think not building anything. Like the you, you added it up first that it was a big fight for not doing stuff. For not designing as a designer um, not designing is something what we did actually and the minimum uh, the scaffolding that you show show so that was probably the biggest thing that uh, was designed for the exhibition program uh, other than that we didn't actually design much we just use the inbuilt quality of the space and the building itself uh, i think drake would add up to that more about that. Yeah, that's, and uh, uh, we cut down the carbon footprint significantly. That was a thing also. So if Hura was over here, then she might have been able to tell the statistics. Um, as much as I, as I remember, probably it was 77% of the carbon that we cut down from the last time. So, so it's actually quite significant, I would say. In that yeah. So yeah, and there was lots of challenge that yeah, AC thing, that was a big accomplishment that we did because the whole big volume that was a like huge, huge amount of AC that was used energy so that we, that we could cut down. I was really glad about that. That we didn't build actually. Yeah, that's it. Fram, you were also able to visit the exhibition in person last year. What, from your perspective, do you think um, is the biggest the biggest accomplishment? Well, I mean, all of the things that that uh, Inteza and uh, Diana just mentioned, I wholeheartedly uh, kind of second. I mean, for me, you know, what it is is that I think oftentimes art is criticized for being purely symbolic. Um, and the processes of these things, especially when they come to ecological phenomena, can be seen as something that you do because it looks good um, or is greenwashing or other things. But to me, what's really important more and more when I think about contemporary art and a project like this is that art sits at the same table with those who have power with those who have kind of disproportionate power in multiple ways, and it can speak with that power. And I think that what uh, Diana pointed to, the six month fight over the air conditioning, which I'm so proud that the Dhaka Arts Summit team could do and really pull through, 
um, or the idea of building less walls uh, and, and just simply not doing the kind of white cube condition that we're used to. I mean, these things ultimately, they're a way of revealing new possibilities to those who control power in disproportionate ways and perhaps prototyping different ways to do things. And so even if part of it is ultimately symbolic, that symbolism, I think, can help to shift certain structural uh, you know, imbalances in the long term. And that's what I'm really you know, personally proud of, is that as a team, we could work together and make it happen. Please. What's your opinion? Yeah, I, I'll try not to repeat everything again because I completely agree with, with everything that's said before. And um, but, but anyway, this design decision, I think, it, of 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 not um, of doing nothing. It's it's it's. Um, I think it cannot be stated enough how important that was, and that came, I think, together a lot with kind of a change of perception, where the whole. Um, I remember still when we went the first time to see the building, uh, kind of the whole team warned us already about the building and all the problems and the difficulties and the fat columns that you have to wrap. And I think um, then seeing more around Bangladesh, I think we realized uh, all together as a team quite fast that the opportunities that the building had instead of the problems it, it, it was putting forward. Um, and then also the, the possibility to sit together with that full team of, of, of uh, technicians as well as curators as kind of all levels at the same time and discuss how we can go forward, like what are the opportunities, what is the conditions of the different positions in the building, what work goes with what, what is the narrative of the end that has to kind of fit within that whole building. Um, it was, was, was very exciting and I think the result was, was also for us um, quite spectacular because instead of having art pieces that that just were put in there kind of uh, for example the the, the, the the Rojas piece that that was proposed as kind of a work that comes from Begens was packed in walls as kind of creating a white cube around it suddenly started to transform with this decision of actually not building those walls and actually the, the artworks themselves became extremely um, specific to the to the place and even to Bangladesh using local techniques to build the walls around it so even uh, this, this dialogue that happened then between the, curator, uh, the curators and, and the, the artists kind of developing the work further um, made actually an exhibition, I think, that, that you could only see there in, in Dhaka. Uh, you could have seen the piece before, but you, it, it, it fully transformed. And actually it, it became also a, a way of, 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 of producing things, of, of producing new works. And, and the column suddenly became the canvas for uh, paintings. The, 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 the ugly floor um, gave the possibility to bring earth inside and actually do things on that floor. So I think that that brought this whole, this one decision, design decision of not um, putting in walls, gave a, a, a world of, of opportunities that were fully exploited by the, by the team, I think, uh, to, to, to a great result, a surprising result. Yeah, kind of following up on that, I wanted to ask you what was the flip side of that, the biggest challenge, and I think in a way Diana already alluded to that, like the, one of the biggest accomplishments is also paired with like a very hard process of actually making that happen in the background. I wanted to kind of flip the question again to Diana, like what do you think was the biggest challenge um, in, in this process? <laughs> Yeah, I think Dries also said something which will also come into my answer, but this change of perception. So all of us on this call are extremely proud of that bamboo structure that became the paintings, that became the platform for the puppet show that you know those scaffolding was rented it went back to a construction site the painting is an artwork that can travel to other exhibitions there have already been requests for it, we are so proud of this. What we're not seeing is actually a group of senior artists pulled out of the show because they felt um, that uh, it was disrespectful to them to put them in a um, space like that, that we weren't respecting their practice. And um, we, so we ended up, I mean, I've never recurated a show in 36 hours um, with so many artworks. We ended up switching, moving these works upstairs to an existing gallery. And then of course the artists in that gallery got upset. Um, in the end, it all turned out great. But the point was we saw here and something that I will carry forward with me to my future um, exhibition projects is those cinema banner painters have names. 
like why are we calling them cinema banner painters and a lot of those artists in this group which was called the Shoemai group I should also say that not all of the artists agreed with this group decision to pull out it was not there were individuals that liked this it was but this is a group that was active in the 1980s they're um they did really pioneering work. Um, but I think that that shift of perception because they didn't understand the full picture of what was going on. We, and some of them actually use cinema banner painting techniques in their own work. We, we hit upon this kind of um, hierarchy issue that's cultural that, that hit to something else. Um, and I think uh, I'm probably not articulate. It's the first time I'm articulating this, but that to me was a huge challenge. It's, um, how, you know, in most of the process, we spoke with the artists as we were developing this, but we were prototyping these walls. It was really a work in process. In fact, at the beginning, like we know, we learned that the paint bled through. So we suddenly had to put another side. Like it was really like a dynamic thing. And I don't think that these artists were able to see what we were seeing because maybe sustainability wasn't part of the discussion in their generation. Um, I'll stop there. Absolutely. Um, Inteza, how do you see, like, what was the biggest challenge from your perspective? Um, most of the challenges were actually quite uh, nicely handled by J Diana. So, uh, like, um, other than that, uh, um, I think the documentation part, the uh, follow up of after the exhibition, I'm making part. So that's the part uh, I am interested in. We are still probably doing it. It's not end because uh, the summit happened in February of 2020. And after that, the coronavirus got started. So that process thing, I don't know. We, we couldn't like follow up in that manner. I myself couldn't follow up in that manner. So I'm really interested about that part. So it's not actually not finished for, for, from my side. So I really want to know also what's the later impact of the whole thing. So it's in the process of probably. So that's the thing. There's no pitfall or something like that. Prem, do you want to jump in? Can you mute it? Sorry, can you hear me now? Okay, good. Um, I could have just kept going like that for 20 minutes and y'all. Uh, no, I, I mean, I wanted to build on what Inteza and Diana said. I mean, to me, I mean, the flip side of what I think is its, you know, potential power of the impact of the show, its ability to influence people in multiple ways is also my, let's say my fear that it's symbolic in some level. I mean, I know that, you know, this was also the last um, big exhibition I traveled to see. Um, and you know, already at that time, I was having a lot of questions about what's the value of, you know, biennials, triennials, all of these things. And I'm, of course, deeply implicated in this. I'm the artistic director of Front International 2022, which is a triennial. Um, and so, you know, I'm wondering how does a process like this, it, I mean, it's amazing what the impact can be in terms of carbon, but people are still flying there to see these things. Uh, there is still a massive impact that happens. And so to me, it's this question of sustainability uh, in the long term. I mean, something that Inteza also just said, which is, um, how does this work continue forward? Like, how do we set up the structures where something like this isn't just a single project where that people do for a year um, as a workshop, but actually it's just embedded into the process of exhibition making in a broader sense or the artistic ecosystem. And to do that, I think requires very different ways of thinking about it. Also in terms of, you know, economic sustainability, figuring out how things like this are not just, again, they're not discrete projects but they're almost like they are positions or they are like departments or pro or things that just go on that are also sustainable and are compensated well for everybody and allow people to thrive and live their lives and feel that this is a part of it so I think that's like a bigger systemic question that I have to think about here and going forward it is what from your perspective was the biggest challenge mm. Um, maybe I'm going to try to continue a little bit more on what, what Prem was saying to, to also not repeat too much what things were said, because I, I think what Prem says at the end, it, it's also quite interesting. And for the moment, our, our um, 
our own approach was very limited to a very technical approach towards the things. So it was much more about like, what's the waste, what's the, you know, how can we do less uh, machines, less air core, all very technical, but it would have been interesting if we could also expand this further into kind of also involve the people, like who is all involved in that kind of how, how does that work as a, as, as an institution, as a system, as, um, on a sustainable way, um, talking more about the, the, the social impact of this, or even on its uh, its position within within Dhaka, within Bangladesh, and and this would be an interesting way of kind of continuing um, this this research, I think, um, and to broaden it still a little bit more, um, and not just limited to kind of the material uh, resources that we're dealing with. I kind of want to continue with you with a question, a more personal question, like what do you think for you personally was like the learning takeaways or how did it change your understanding of sustainability? Um, it was it, it was quite a lot about, yeah, about how also how do you change this perception of people? I think this is is, is quite important within our profession because the as an architect, you question more and more kind of about how much can we still do in kind of actual building and how does the, the, the profession changes. And I think it's a lot linked to a change of perception, how things um, are conceived. You know, maybe we don't build more, but we, 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 we change the use, how we use spaces or how we see spaces, how, um, can can we just by getting a little bit away of our of, of what we expect of what norms kind of push upon us um of what we should bring forward you know what do we have already in our hands and what is the value of that before we start to 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 erase that and uh try to cover up everything and and kind of a very um um uh, tabula rasa approach and kind of how can we get get away from that i think that that is something that has been following us quite a lot and uh, i think dhaka has been serving for us as a as a standard sentence of like yeah but in dhaka um that's kind of a good example so i think uh we hope we can uh, continue these thoughts further kind of going counterclockwise and like back to prem yeah what you is your personal takeaway and how did it change the notion of sustainability I mean, it, I have to say it transformed my I, thinking about sustainability entirely. I mean, in the sense that in many ways, I think before that I thought about sustainability, but often with a sense of dread or despair of what it is that one can actually do in the face of this. And so on the one level, of course, I think I learned a lot of practical things. I mean, Dries mentioned the kind of technical aspect of the work, just in terms of thinking about building walls or climate conditioning or shipping or other factors. But actually what it's more made me realize is, of course, when we think about ecological problems, they are, we have to think about them holistically. They're connected to all kinds of other social problems, problems that come out of colonialism and capitalism and that, that are connected to justice on multiple levels. But it all starts in some ways, I think, with people. It's about how people relate to each other. And even the anecdote that Diana shared before, the challenge of some artists of a different generation not understanding um, a kind of another set of artists, or also the, the challenge of some people in bureaucratic positions not understanding why you wouldn't have climate conditioning. All of these kind of problems, I think, also come, well, I don't know if they can be solved, I, but I think that one approach for them is how can we interrelate in different ways? Like how can we bring more people together at the beginning of a process so that they understand what is at stake and what are the different ways in which people can work together to do that? And I think we kind of modeled that within our own process as a team, as a workshop, bringing together these competencies, both from DACA and internationally, and really going through that process together. And so in some ways for me, it's like what I learn is to continue to start those processes with different people and you know also with the artists involved but also other staff and people at different levels because i think that it like a fractal it kind of like starts small and keeps growing bigger is my hope absolutely um Inteza, i would like to bounce this question to you yeah um 
pretty much the same thing. Um, like uh, Drake's and uh, uh, Prem has already said um, all the stuff. Uh, I think the um, again um, like the possibilities that it opened up. Like uh, this kind of things are like people are thinking like that. So before working in this um, like in, for this team, like I was also uh, working in other projects as an architect. So um, I I usually work with this kind of crafty kind of stuff and sustainable. Um, so uh, when I was designing for this exhibition, so what we actually did was like not designing it. So whenever I was telling my friends and talking with other people, so what what did you design or something? So I, I was actually telling we didn't actually design. The process was not to design. So that probably change some of their perspective. So yeah, it's a philosophical, I would say, change of mind that is, that's what, what uh, if people talk about it uh, a few years from now on, so that would be the thing. Uh, so that, that's it. Diana? I guess this, I'm gonna take a different approach, but it links to Prim's comment about people or, you know, people and perspective has come up all here, but sustainability is also, um, you know, we have limits, right? Like, so I think I really push the team to their absolute limit, my own indeed. Like the Mahasas, we had a group of art historians who were there like doing workshops, like before the summit opened, they could not believe that we opened on time. I mean, I don't think any of us could have, but I think that some of these ideas were really overly ambitious, not the design, not the design ideas, but like more like some of the, maybe the, the volume of, programs um, that were happening or the um, the volume of exhibitions like we had over 500 participants in here I think that we all need to think about scale and like maybe this pandemic when we're all stuck at home like has made me also think maybe it's you know gentleness is also an important thing when we think about uh, sustainability right like also when we think of our own travel schedules why were we killing each ourselves with jet lag and all these things what do you get out of that so I think it's more when I'm designing something as a curator, trying to factor in giving people a good work-life balance. Uh, you know, it's not necessary to have to be up all night for a week. Um, of course, like, you know, mistakes happen when you're experimenting, right? That, that, that require that, but how to try to, um, I don't know, tone it down a bit while still having an impact. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I, that's actually something it's funny that you say that because that was a that was something I was thinking there as we were, you know, uh, I remember all these uh, uh, tryouts with the with the mud wall with the Adobe and like how much that is actually requires a completely different framework and understanding of time in order to engage with that technique to engage with that ancestral knowledge. It, it's necessary to also embrace a completely different understanding of time. You know, and we, as you we were trying the last minutes and some things were not working and they were trying again. Um, I, I think it, for me personally, to add to the discussion, I think this dimension of time added to the notion of sustainability, that's kind of what I personally really take away um, from this process. Um, and also understanding maybe the time that you have, because this is a government building, we had really limited time uh, in that building. And also when the building saw that mud, they thought it was disrespectful that we were covering their national gallery with, with dirt. <laughs> it's uh, all of these things, so many layers. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering a little bit, I don't know if Claire um, uh, is aware of if there are already questions popping up on Twitch. Um, if not, I would like us to kind of continue exploring this dimension of time, which I think it's really, um, yeah, interesting. I don't know if Prem, do you have a reflection on that to share? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that the last points that that have been made both by you, Nina, and by uh, Diana are so relevant. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about the time of exhibitions and how to slow down the kind of spectacular quality. Like, again, this idea that you show up to a place for three days or a week or you, or even like a biennial triennial that lands for a month or two, and that it's all about things happening right then and the stress that goes into producing that, as Diana has already uh, pointed out. And so I think a lot about how every exhibition we make, we think of them as being temporary, but of course they're not. 
um, every exhibition comes from something that was before. And in fact, it leaves all of its traces in the world, environmentally and also socially. It leaves um, good things and it leaves traumas, it leaves waste. And so I think that, um, you know, to really think about how we might slow that down, which things need to be made, um, but also when do they need to be made and how, um, and so I, I want to throw out there, I mean, we've been talking about Inteza and Dries and Dinah about, you know, not designing, but maybe there's also a value to not making to not actually making certain exhibitions or things um, because that actually, uh, the, the sheer acceleration of contemporary life and of um, consumption under capitalism is also what's brought us in large part to this brink. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Claire has a question. Uh, Claire, do you wanna jump in? Or... There she is. You're muted, Claire. Thank you. Um, so, so I'm I'm uh, really amazed to to learn about the resistance that um, you had to face as a team with your concept and with your um, ideas, especially with this um, concept of of doing less. Um, and you 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 talk about these powers that be like is something anonymous. And I was wondering who were these people? Who did you need to convince? And how did you do that? With what arguments? I mean, um, Diana, you just uh, mentioned this difficulty to accept the, the, the bare material of, of mud um, because it was um, conceived as unrespectful. And so I was wondering what kind of um, maybe storytelling or, or vision or, or arguments did you use in order to pe bring people on board and um, be able to realize this in your project? <laughs> well, uh, it's not straightforward because we are guests in a government building with government employees and um, they have certain views of how things should be, right? So. Um, and they, um, you know, I'm not going to get into all of these politics of these things, but it's, uh, it's, it's not easy, right? So it's also sometimes the institution wants to use the spaces for their own kind of shows and not give them to us. So it's a lot of these gives and takes. Um, to be honest, part of it was the American style of doing it and apologizing later because um, if they would have seen what was happening, they might have not had the capacity to um, understand that. But for example, the mud walls that we talked about, they were originally supposed to be situated inside. And we realized that if the building saw that there were fossils and mud in there, they would be convinced it would collapse the floor. There would be no amount of science that could be used to prove to them otherwise. So there were certain things where, um, we saw the battle that couldn't be won and we saw a room a room to like explain it after um in other situations it was doing the research on the weather for the last five years during february to convince that it actually could be okay to not have ac and that those freak days of heat because there were really bad heat waves in the 2018 summit were anomalies and i had to agree to personally take on that risk so if, if there was a heat wave and people were complaining i would have to answer for it but i was willing to do that um but it was also doing the research to back up that it could be okay um and also explaining to artists that it's it's not that we don't respect you and want to put you in a hot space it's that you know we this is part of the concept it, so it was a lot of um communicating but i guess our stakeholders were the patrons who also want this to look great for their friends and they want it to be something that they're proud of and they were very you know they, they were holding our hands in this process um the the government who has this building the artists who have their work to show in there um and us also us it had to be something that we agreed with as a as a design team I mean, I do think that in some ways, I think the model of one of the things I really appreciate and, you know, <clears throat> I mean, uh, thinking about um, Mobin and Sazad and, you know, also Rea and like the importance of, uh, it sounds so simple. And I don't want to make this sound like some simple kind of cure panacea for everything, but I've found in my work since then, the value, um, how important it is to have as many people as you can who are going to be part of the decision making process at the table in the beginning in different ways and to actually understand what are the different 
kind of desires and fears that are at play in that. And I mean, for example, I mean, I can just say, you know, I know that when we first um, got involved as, let's say, designers from, you know, Switzerland and from Berlin, I know that there were questions about, okay, well, will there be from an institutional side or from a kind of building technical side, things that we're not allowed to do, things that are going to become constraints? And, um, you know, oftentimes I think that when designers work in a more kind of like with the with the fiction of autonomy or independence, um, and this goes for artists as well, they see constraints as a negative. Whereas I think that if you get the constraints on the table at the beginning, then they actually become um, productive, generative things for your design process that you're creating, because you know them, they don't hit you later, and you can figure out what is the best way to negotiate those. And it's not always going to be an easy process of, you know, of, of consensus or of everybody agreeing on a thing, but you decide which things are the highest priority and what are the decision making processes that need to be followed to accomplish the best successes. Yeah, and you know, there's there's another thing I need to share with all these people around the table. There's someone that's missing from this table that is a very key part of this discussion, who is Akshay from Prohelvetsia. He runs the Prohelvetsia New Delhi office. And Prohelvetsia New Delhi has been a partner of the summit since nearly the beginning. And they're always trying to help us to figure out how can we partner to do something better. And uh, he had asked me, like, what, what do I think the summit needed to be better? And I said it was this kind of exhibition design think tank and that kind of trust to do something like this uh, also, because this isn't a straightforward, it's not like funding a Swiss artist to be in a Biennale. This is far more complicated um, than that. But um, I think that was uh, also like to, to see the value of, of, um, of these kinds of transnational connections to just, so the other reason why the summit was given this mandate is that we, we published our kind of methodologies open source. We're hoping that people all over the world can learn from this. Um, and I guess we can learn from other examples as people execute this. I, I have a question for Inteza. Um, how like did your friends and the people around you, how did they experience the summit? Um, like uh, Art7 has been happening for like four or five years from now, like four or five summits already. So I, usually they, what they're used to seeing is like uh, the exhibitions are really kind of boring over here. So when Dhaka Art Summit came, it like bring in a new flair of like the, this white cardboard boxes exhibitions that we, you, you have in Europe. We usually don't have that kind of designed exhibition over here. So when Art Summit got started, so that what I, I think probably pulled in the crowd that uh, new kind of exhibitions were happening. But this time, what we actually did like, uh, those things were not there because the exhibition was designed in a different kind of way. So for some of them, it was quite surprising. Like uh, yeah, there's a change in, so they probably realized that uh, the design, the things art summit used to be, it's a quite a bit different like the previous sessions. So that's what I would say. Yeah. Can I can I quickly react yeah. to that? Because I, I think you describe it very nice, uh, the, the the white cardboard boxes. Um, because I think it was also for us, um I, I remember you that, that there was a discussion also at one point, like, look, this is also what is kind of expected here, that you know, kind of a almost a kind of a copy of, of what we know more as a standard here, but um of kind of the, the white box, nicely ventilated, constant temperature, and, and that uh, you were bringing that also forward, like, okay, we should make sure this doesn't look like an arts and crafts fair, you know, this is still an exhibition, and kind of how do we bring this forward? And then I think maybe the, the most um, interesting part was actually when, like, first of all, we saw a lot of exhibitions um, when we were, and, and artist studios when we were in, in, in Bangladesh already, that were already dealing with this very contextual approach in very interesting way where we saw the exhibition on the building side somebody that was fantastic uh using every opportunity and then the team coming here to basel and going to see models like the schaulag and actually questioning um from your perspective like okay what's happening here kind of you know why is this in a white box where is the audience where are the people like why isn't there this connection with kind of its surroundings uh, it's all about because the only thing people could explain this was about how was everything very nicely preserved and it was there in these pristine boxes uh, very perfect conditions um, 
and and I, I like I think this this was quite a, a fascinating discussion, kind of this this questioning of like how far can you push it? What, what does it still need? What, how can it still be conceived as art? And I think then Bangladesh was probably a very um, rewarding place to work in or context to work in because because uh, we also realized quite fast the position of, of artists within society how that is very much anchored in 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 society and i think uh diana and um catherine with the, with, with the curating of the the, coll the collective show was was very uh interesting to see how you know there's also this this conception of art goes beyond um kind of the production of a sculpture within a white cube it goes actually uh much more out to the people and i think um, but it was definitely, I, I remember the, the finding the balance between like, uh, you know, how can we make it look still like the thing to see um, in this context where you understand that this is uh, art that is presented uh, against the, 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 on one side, the white cube, on the other side, the craft show. I would also like to add the, the sheer number of people that were actually visiting these exhibitions were huge. Like in nine days, we were probably having like, five lakhs of people, like uh, 500,000 people visiting. So that actually had an impact. Uh, like uh, when Diana was doing that same thing as I worked with Man, so she was telling that, are those things going to sustain throughout the exhibition of nine days? Some of the, you know, so many people are going to come and visit. So that's the thing, nine, 500,000 people are coming. So that's um, um, one other factor is that we don't have anything like this happening so that's a, one of the crowd pooling factors that's uh, like um, artists from all over the world are coming over here uh, visiting, uh, exhibiting their artwork that's an opportunity but uh, the sheer number of people visiting is also like 500,000 I have a question for Diana um, you were talking a little bit about the kind of negotiations you had with um the the institution and the patrons and and but i also i would also be interested in like how this process has also changed artworks because i know it did like i know there was a lot of negotiation with art as and then things became different things and materials became other materials and could you maybe talk a little bit about that yeah um but i always i mean i don't know who gave me this insight but someone said that there's like primary market and secondary market curators I meaning there's some that like work with the artist to kind of develop the work and develop the process there's others that just take a final work don't talk to the artist and install it however they want um i think good shows need to be somewhere in between but um yeah with the artist it was from the beginning also sharing the concept note that this you know this exhibition design program started at the beginning of the summit so it was part of the thematics so if you were going to be part of this team you needed to be on board with this if you were not on board with this it wasn't the right place to show your work um so um i think probably the i mean this this story was one that came out of kind of panic but it worked for the right way do you guys remember that beautiful clove and bead cube uh or sorry curtain by madiha sikander um there's this beautiful work that's stitched together with cloves and beads that makes this transparent curtain and you can smell the cloves kind of wafting through the space this piece was meant to be in the South Plaza area. Um, so when you kind of opened the doors to go into that open plaza, you would see it through this curtain. So for us, it was kind of as designers, this kind of visual, um, yeah, I guess tease. Thank goodness the, the pieces weren't finished in that plaza on time because we could not install the work because it was so dusty. And this artist was from Pakistan, couldn't get a visa at the last minute. Um, the flights were canceled because COVID was starting to happen. So. Anyway, long story short, because of a scheduling issue uh, with the timing of install, we had to move the piece upstairs. Um, and actually, it worked incredibly well. Had the piece been on that ground floor, people would have run through it with 500,000 people. It would have been broken. It would have been completely lost. Um, but the only way we were able to do this was that the artist was very much involved in, in the kind of planning and design process and on hand for that. So I think any artist um, that's making new work or making a site specific work or work like this with really hands on install, like have to be involved with the curatorial team because also as you're um, experimenting things can move last minute. So I mentioned also to you earlier about the suddenly, you know, it was like, I think 20 paintings that were pretty big had to go find another space like three days before the show that was only possible because of this kind of curator artist design 
um, and constantly changing collaboration. Like there are a lot of works that move locations many times. Um, and I'm also very grateful to the trust and labor of the artist to put up with that amount of time and change because it can be a bit uh, nerve wracking. Um, and it's a lot of trust. Like we're not gonna install your work in a white cube and you might not be there to see it. How oh, do you trust us to do that? Claire, are there any questions from the audience? So there is no question yet. Um, I have another little question, if I may jump in. Um, it's um, actually about the figure of 77% that you mentioned earlier, um, that this was um, uh, the carbon footprint that had been um, uh, saved by um, your project. And I was wondering um, how, on what um, uh, facts and uh, um, impacts was this calculated? I know it is um, Herrera Jabin who, who did this um, analysis and um, which couldn't join us today, but I guess you're also um, aware of how um, this, this statistics was made. And I was very much in, interested in, in knowing what are maybe the major factors that influence this um, very high uh, numbers of 77%. I think in Tesla you have to answer that because yeah. I don't I haven't been in DACA, I don't yeah. know how that was measured. Yeah, that was from the last year's summit. So we calculated the Herrera, Herrera actually calculated the last year's summit's uh, carbon footprint, and then we calculated this year's carbon footprint approximately in both cases. So, so I think this is, we shipped far fewer works. So I think that was part of it. There was less shipping. This, the fossils shipped by sea, not by air. Um, less, a lot less particle board, uh, a lot less printed materials. Like, so we didn't want like these PVC plastic signs that are used in Bangladesh's signage. We banned those. Um, so I think that was part of it. Uh, the no AC, the AC was a huge contributor. So by removing the AC, that was another bit. Um, the carpets, there was no carpets. Oh, the carpets. Oh, yeah, thank God we got rid of those carpets. Yeah, the car, yeah, so we didn't have carpets. Um, so yeah, we just, every time we used a material, we thought about what would happen when it gets thrown away. And there used to just be so many things that were thrown away. And this time it was just, yeah, it was a different approach. And I think another thing, like one criticism would be, why are you flying so many people to Bangladesh? Like, but you know what, in retrospect, I'm really happy we did that because we didn't know the world would stop. And we had people from Nigeria meeting people from Dhaka, meeting people from, uh, from Sabah, uh, you know, people from, uh, people from all over the world convening in Dhaka. And I also think it's important for people to see the way that people in Dhaka live. Um, maybe I'll, there was a text once written about the Dhaka Art Summit that was called Learning from Dhaka, which was like a riff off of learning from Athens. And a friend of mine was like, actually, you know, the people in Dhaka aren't there to teach you anything, like they live there. Um, and they have their own way of living, their own way of designing things. And I don't think everything needs to, to be a great art institution. You don't need to look like Venice or like uh, something in London or New York, you can do things in a different manner. And that's, I'm so grateful to everyone on this call and all of our partners and artists and people who trusted us, because I, I firmly believe that. And I think that this summit could attest to that. Absolutely. Um, I'm just checking the clock. I think it's a really beautiful way to somehow conclude and summarize everything, um, Diana. I wonder if anybody else wants to um, share uh, some final thoughts. I saw that Prem on yeah. YouTube. So. There are two questions that just came in. Sorry to interrupt. If I can bring them in. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's the first question um, is about uh, just this point that you were mentioning, uh, Diana, at the end um, of, re of recycling um, the material that you were using. Um, so the question is what role plays sustainability and specifically the recycling of, of exhibition material when you design and curate a new exhibition? So I guess this is. Um, uh, towards um, Diana and uh, and probably also uh, uh, Prem, um, if you like from the curatorial point of view. Yeah, I mean, I think the best example are these, um, these we call them the amoebas, but these kind of curving walls where Joe De Shilpo and Savvy Contemporary collaborated on this, um, on a painting. So the wall became a painting. 
the painting has its own life. It's going to show other places in, in the future. So the material has another use. Yeah, we, we thought about recycling a lot, actually. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it was a, a huge, and, and that, that area, so I guess this is a context that other people don't understand. These amoebas replaced um, a whole floor where false walls were built to partition it. And those particle boards would just be torn down. And because this look was so sexy the institution would then go and rebuild these walls multiple times during the year for other shows after we done after we did that so it wasn't just the impact of the summit it was other people using that technique so i think that the when we look at the impact of what we did i think it'll be more than the summit because i think other people will rethink about rethink how they use that space too and i'll just add very briefly there um, I think like I've already learned from that approach in a way, for example, with the triennial that I'm curating um, Front International, there's already an example where we're talking with some architects about instead of creating new furniture for a part of the exhibition, we'll prototype furniture they're going to create for a permanent building that will open maybe a year or two after the triennial and use that as an opportunity to make the furniture then it'll be stored and then used permanently. So instead of this idea of kind of building a thing for each use, you build a thing with its long-term use in mind. Can, can I quickly add something to that about the, the something we didn't discuss at all? Uh, actually, um, it can seem a detail, but I find it quite important that actually also the, the Dhaka Art Summit is just moving for this, this, this 10 days into the Shilpa Kala building. And actually, it also become a top, became a topic of what happens if you move out and kind of, you know, they're, they're putting back in order the toilets, they're putting back in order uh, windows that are broken, they're putting actually a public building. They're, 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 a lot of the money that's also invested is, 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 is on the long term for this public building and it's invested actually in public infrastructure, um, which I think is also not negligible in this whole story, how this actually is also part of the sustainable character of this whole project. Yeah, it's also interesting because, you know, I had to look at the budget of all of this, but like, you know, the cleaning bills skyrocketed, but at the same time, how nice to have a clean building. Like, you know, people were covering up these cobwebbed, like disgusting windows, like things that they didn't want to see, they would just build to cover it up. Why not just fix it? So um, I think that was, yeah, we should, cleaning has a value too, or, or having, it, it, I think, yeah, the, we def, the goal that we all set before we even like embarked on this was to leave the building better than when we inhabited it. There is one more question that just arrived. Um, so the person is writing, thanks so much for shifting our perception with these important insights. There are obviously a lot to learn here from uh, for institutions in Wiener area regions. Do you consider issuing a set of guidelines or another way of propagating the model that you were discussing? Yes, so that's another way of sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> They're available if you download our catalog, which is free, so it's a PDF. Um, I think the Dhaka Art website's temporarily down, so check it next week, but um, you can download it. And we've, we've published uh, our guidelines and things to think about as you um, embark on this. Uh, so um, yeah, check the Dhaka Art Summit website next week, download the catalog, and it's in there. But I, I mean, also this moment here, in a way, is a, it's a moment of like sharing that process. And I think it has another layer of information because it also contains uh, the struggles, the difficulties that we that the, the whole team encounter as making it. And then just to kind of reiterate that this conversation here is going to be transcribed and edited and then also be published later on in future. So the idea is that uh, I personally don't necessarily see it as like a guideline or as a recipe. You know, a lot of times when we think about design practices and design methods, we tend to think in terms of like fixed methodologies, but more as an orientation or a direction, you know, to kind of reorient ourselves. Uh, and, and with that, it's so um, the goal is to kind of just share it with the world and keep learning with others who will engage in similar uh, processes and then add to that kind of uh, um, thinking. Yeah, I think what, what you say, Nina, is quite important in this whole story. And then it's, it's that it's, it, of course, when you're making up guidelines, there's always the, the, the tendency to put it in very clean phrases. And, and I think this is a, a very particular case that you can uh, study and look at. Uh, but of course, it's very hard to, to take exactly this and make this the role model for everything. I think everything, uh, I think that's in general with sustainability, it's about actually looking at each individual case and trying to kind of 
analyze what's going on and work from there and not um i think it's the danger is that it becomes a set of guidelines that then become the excuse for kind of applying it everywhere even in cases that are maybe in another context I think. Mm -hmm. like colonialism exactly i think uh this is this is the start of one thing that keeps on evolving and growing in the best case I think. Okay, so I think looking at the clock, um, it's been an hour. So um, does any of you want to share some last thoughts? Um, Nina, do you want to um, add something to this round that we had? No, I mean, maybe just to finish up with what I said earlier, I think with a lot of these questions, you know, I think the purpose is also to transform ourselves, you know, and transform our perspective Perception, you know, and shift and reorient ourselves. And I think I can speak for myself in this process and that definitely happened. Uh, it's definitely something that I take with me and that will shape the way I see things and I practice design and I make things in the world or don't. Um, and it's something that I know I could have only realized, achieved together with all of you and so many others who were not in the Zoom call today, but hopefully one day we can all meet. Um, that's the spirit of that's the hope and I just want to say that thank you everybody for like uh, uh, allowing me to 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 learn and um, yeah I'm just very grateful to everybody thank you from my side as well for everybody to join and to share all your experience and uh, that was really generous and very very inspiring I will thank you everyone I just want to say it's so great to see everyone even yeah. on the screen. No, I know. <laughs> yeah. If we were in real life, we'd have to do karaoke right now, but that's not going to happen on Zoom right now. But just keep, everyone heads. keep practicing, keep practicing. Exactly. <laughs> Rehearsal. Rehearsal for the next one. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> that's great. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. Bye.